you next to me. He was out there. He was saving lives of the nurse. If you bang pots for him, how about you make it loud with your hands for your next comedian, Sean Patrick Flynn, everybody! Thank you so much. See a lot of oxygen tanks in the audience. My patients are here. Do not light a match, okay? Thank you guys all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sean Patrick Flynn. I'm a registered nurse. Thank you so much. We didn't even get an applause from the government, so I appreciate it. <laughs> but registered nurse is my profession, as well as my stripper persona. <laughs> hey, they want to take away nurses pay. You got to do something, right? <laughs> as a male registered nurse, unfortunately, I hear a lot of sexist comments. It's true. As a matter of fact, recently this guy came up to me and he said, isn't nursing dominated by women? And I was like, yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, I became a nurse because I want to be dominated by women. Get on board, everybody. <laughs> People say rude things to me all the time, though. One of the most rude things that I hear, though, is actually a question. People ask me all the time, why didn't you become a doctor? And I always respond with, why didn't you? guy that asked me that recently, I asked him, I said, what do you do for a living? And he's like, I'm actually unemployed. I was like, well, why didn't you become anything? <laughs> Nursing's actually a second degree for me. Um, I went back to school. Um, I couldn't get a job with my first degree when I decided to go back. Because the first time I went to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And basically what I did was just major in stupidity. <laughs> but I did get the science background because I did minor in sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> but I did go back to school and I do have a lot of like knowledge now. Like I went back to school, I studied anatomy. I studied physiology, chemistry, and genetics. And I now work on one of the most specialized ICUs in the country. Thank you so much. And I have so much knowledge and skill that if someone here tonight were to fall over and have a cardiac arrest, I could save your life. If I like you. <laughs> Like, I'm paying attention. Are you laughing at my material? <laughs> like, I might need a little more from you if you want mouth to mouth. <laughs> um, I do have a lot of knowledge, like I said, though. I've been an ICU nurse for five years now. And I've learned one thing as a nurse. And it's that we're all sick people. Everyone in this room has an underlying medical condition. We all do. We don't always know it though, right? But after five years in the ICU, sometimes I can just look at someone and tell what they're suffering with. <laughs> Nearsightedness. <laughs> Let's see what else we got here. 
Hmm. Alopecia. <laughs> Look, I'm not worried he's gonna attack me, okay? I'm not. Not only do I know how to save lives, I know how to end them. <laughs> Let's see, there's gotta be someone else here. You. Enlarged penis. <laughs> Oh, I'm right. I'm always right. <laughs> always right. I'm glad I got into nursing, though, because, like, it helped me get my life together. Because when I was younger, I used to do a lot of drugs. I used to do drugs. I used to do all of the drugs. But I don't do drugs anymore. Now I just deal drugs to my patients. <laughs> Have you guys ever heard the expression, laughter is the best medicine? Yeah. Well, it's not true. <laughs> because in my experience, the best medicine is morphine. <laughs> we give morphine actually at my job with other pain medications. We give it for post-operative pain. And in order to give an intravenous medication, you have to have IV access. And I happen to be very good at putting in an IV. I am so good at putting in an IV, I brag about it on my dating profile. <laughs> and I get hit up all the time by heroin addicts. <laughs> so as a nurse, a big part of our job is actually pain assessment and pain medication administration. And I take that part of my job very seriously. And what's crazy, as a nurse, sometimes I can feel my patient's pain. And to show my empathy, sometimes when I'm giving my patients their pain medications, I also take a hit. <laughs> I lied, I still do drugs. <laughs> Um, I've been on the front lines for the last two years. Thank you so much. But it was kind of weird in the beginning of the pandemic, right? Because like, nobody knew what was going on. Everybody started calling nurses heroes. Heroes. I thought that was so weird because I knew what I was getting into when I became a nurse. Like every day I work with deadly diseases. I work with E. coli. I work with Clostridium difficile. I work with health insurance companies. <laughs> the worst diseases on earth. <laughs> but it made me realize something when we started using the word hero for what we were doing. It made me realize in this country, we use the word hero just for someone that does some shit the rest of us don't want to do. <laughs> And if that's the case, my hero is the guy dating my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Nobody should have to do that. <laughs> I've been on the front lines for two years, like I said, directly working with COVID patients, one-on-one, -on -one, 12 hours a day, up a COVID patient's ass, literally. <laughs> But all this time, I never got COVID. Never got COVID. Not once, never got COVID. Got gonorrhea three times. <laughs> never got COVID. People always ask me about the vaccine too, because I work on the front lines. I think I didn't get it because I'm vaccinated, that's all. And I'm not here to start a battle. But what I'm gonna say though, I will give you some feedback of what I learned on the front lines with the vaccine, okay? So I'm gonna tell you right now, if you had the Pfizer vaccine, you're gonna be okay. If you had the Moderna vaccine, you're gonna be okay. 
if you got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you're also gonna be okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm licensed in 35 different states to practice. Wow. Thank you. 35 states I can practice in. And one of our main jobs is that we administer medications, as I told you earlier. And we do that three ways in nursing. We do it orally, we do it intravenously, and we do it rectally. Which is, of course, my favorite route of administration. <laughs> but we have to do that sometimes because sometimes a patient can't swallow. And sometimes they don't make that medication IV. And sometimes the patient just likes being fingered in the asshole. <laughs> And I can tell you from experience, that would be like half of this audience. <laughs> I mean, you can tell when someone's into it. Like, I had a guy last week ask me for a suppository. And I was like, whoa, man, I'm seeing somebody. <laughs> for those of you that actually don't know what a suppository is, a suppository is the medication that goes up your butt. And basically what it is, it's a medication, it goes up your rectum, and it melts, and it takes action. It's essentially an M&M for your asshole. <laughs> but I had to give one last week, and this patient did something that really pissed me off. This guy tried to crack a joke with my finger up his ass. <laughs> he was bent over like this. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> Hey, Sean, has the glove ever ripped when you're putting one in? I was like, nah, man, that's actually never happened because I've never worn a glove. <laughs> oh, my <God. sighs> oh my gosh, she's right. <laughs> that's what he said when I said I never wore a glove. <laughs> when it comes to suppositories, you never forget your first. <laughs> I remember my first. He was this young man. He was about 23 years old. He was a congenital heart patient. And he was having the last surgery in a series of surgeries. And I'd give this guy a suppository. It was my first time giving one, his first time getting one. <laughs> and his parents were there. <laughs> it got really awkward. I felt like I had to say something, you know? I'm about to sodomize their son right in front of them. <laughs> So like, as I'm inserting the suppository into this kid's ass, I look his dad right in the eye and I go, so I guess I'm part of the family now? <laughs> I get a Christmas card every year. I'll tell you, I've been a nurse for five years and this finger right here has seen a lot of action. <laughs> Been a nurse just for five years, and this thing has been up more asses than vaginas at this point. <laughs> I never wear a glove, exactly. <laughs> never wear a glove. And if you don't believe me, come take a whiff. <laughs> I don't always use this finger. Sometimes when a patient pisses me off, I use this one. <laughs> when I decided to become a nurse, the only thing that I, the only goal that I had was I just wanted to be a good nurse. And that only comes with experience. 
And after five years in the ICU, I finally figured out the key to being a good nurse. The key to being a good nurse is that you have to be compassionate. You have to care about your patients. And after five years, I can finally say, I'm ready to start trying to be a good nurse. <laughs> no, but a big part of our job is to protect patients. And like after five years, I figured out some days the best way for me to do that is to just call out sick. <laughs> Sometimes we have to protect ourselves from our patients because sometimes they will come out of surgery and they'll be really confused and combative. And when that happens, what we do is we restrain the patient. We tie them down, their wrists to the bed. And we do that so they don't hurt themselves or so they don't hurt us. Or if we just need to grab a cup of coffee. <laughs> No, it is a dangerous job though. Every year nurses are, thousands and thousands of nurses are assaulted every year on the job. In fact, I once was stabbed at work. It happened. And when I was stabbed, I blamed myself. I blamed myself because I was the one that gave him way too much Viagra. <laughs> way too much. <laughs> Viagra is an extremely dangerous drug. We actually give it on my unit for pulmonary hypertension. I know none of you know what that is. <laughs> but we give it for pulmonary hypertension. It is a very dangerous drug because if you give a patient too much Viagra, the patient will poke your eye right out. <laughs> The first time I gave a patient Viagra was really kind of funny because he was really concerned. He was like, hey, Sean, am I going to get a boner? I was like, nah, dude, probably not going to happen. We typically use small doses for small dicks. <laughs> Speaking of dicks, a uh, big part of my job is actually washing people's private parts. As a nurse, I run artificial hearts, I operate dialysis machines, and I clean dicks. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, right? And I think I'm pretty good at it, too. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because I was giving this patient a sponge bath once, and he got an erection. <laughs> which was really awkward. <laughs> and incredibly flattering at the same time. I mean, I know I have a nice face, but apparently I have really soft hands too. I told you I never wear a glove. I was a professional though, and I told him, don't be embarrassed and make sure you leave the money on the bedside table. That's great, I love an applause break. <laughs> the pandemic was really hard for me. Uh, I now have PTSD. And the hardest part about having PTSD is that I'm an extremely negative person now. I used to be very positive. But I'm negative now. Like, some people here might look at a glass and say, hey, that glass is half full. But me, now, I look at a patient, I say, that guy's half dead. <laughs> I had the day off today because my patient died yesterday. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> Did work out in my favor though. <laughs> look, some days when I go into work, I have to pull the plug on a patient if I'm lucky. <laughs> what? Those are the easiest days. You can't fuck up. <laughs> and sometimes when we pull the plug on a patient, it can take a very long time for the person to pass away. And yesterday, this particular guy 
would not die. <laughs> so finally, after a few hours, this guy's father comes out of the room and he goes, Hey, Sean, can you speed this up? <laughs> and I was like, man, I can. I know how to. But you guys ordered an autopsy. <laughs> And I am not trying to answer all those questions again. <laughs> Look, pulling the plug on a patient is not my favorite thing to do at work. It's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> and my arm gets tired, you know what I mean? I personally think that I should be paid more for what I do because I'm practically a professional killer. <laughs> But for the good guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. And I keep track, too. 13 kills and counting. <laughs> if I keep this up, I'm going to go down as one of the greats. <laughs> There's this nurse I work with, Karen. She's really close to retirement. Killed like a thousand people. <laughs> She's the Kobe Bryant of nurses. <laughs> One thing I learned at my job is we are all gonna die. Got news for you, you're gonna die. Some of us sooner than later. <laughs> I'm a gambling man, I just play the odds. <laughs> After the pandemic has been so tough, I actually thought about changing specialties. I don't wanna quit nursing altogether but I want a little bit less blood piss and shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I thought about becoming a psychiatric nurse and I applied for a job two weeks ago and I was denied in two hours. And they actually called me. It was the hiring manager. And she said, Mr. Flynn, I just want you to know you're a highly qualified candidate, but you cannot be a practitioner here if you're already a patient. <laughs> I thought about changing careers too. But I thought about mostly, I was like, when I was a kid, like I never wanted to be a nurse. When I was a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? A writer. A writer? You weren't planning on making any money, that's for sure. <laughs> I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut. Because when I was a kid, my parents threw us all into the station wagon and we drove down to Cape Canaveral in Florida to watch the Challenger take off. Oh. <laughs> or try to take off. <laughs> Look, if we're being glass half full people here, that mission was not a complete failure. They did make it to the heavens. I'll take all the oh's. I'll take them all night long. I'll take them. I'll take them. Well, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. When I decided to change careers, like I knew one thing is I could not follow in my father's footsteps because my father was a felon. And it's kind of frowned upon to be in that family business. But my father spent seven years in prison for assaulting someone. Spent seven years in prison. And the crazy thing is his victim spent way more time with him than I ever did. <laughs> he did spend seven years in Attica, which is New York's maximum security prison. And I could kind of relate because I spent seven years at North Carolina State University. <laughs> and I only have a bachelor's. <laughs> but what I hated the most about my dad was that my dad was notorious for being late. Like one time, he was coming over for my fifth birthday party, and he didn't show up until I was 16 years old. <laughs> it's when he was paroled. <laughs> but my mother, 
she was a nurse. My mother was a nurse. That's why I decided to become a nurse. My mother, yes, give it up for the nurses. I decided to become a nurse because my mother was a nurse. And my mother is one of the most caring and sensitive people that I know. So I decided to follow in her footsteps and become a professional killer. <laughs> I moved to California five years ago uh, from North Carolina. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of North Carolina, it's actually a third world state. <laughs> our main exports are cigarettes. And our state motto is, first in cancer. <laughs> but I moved here five years ago, and this entire time I've been trying to figure out why they call California the golden state. Finally figured out. It's called the golden state because it's always on fire. <laughs> always on fire. Is your state motto, caution flammable? <laughs> and when it rains, is it called a golden shower? <laughs> it should be. The one thing I've noticed in LA is just the abundance of homeless people. You cannot miss the homeless here. And the homeless here are more aggressive than anywhere I have ever been in my life. And I lived in New York City. The homeless here are so aggressive. But I thought the other day, I was like, maybe the homeless in New York are not as aggressive because they're just half frozen. <laughs> Everybody have a great pandemic. I actually lost about 40 pounds during the pandemic. Thank you. And I decided to do that because every COVID patient they wheeled into my ICU, they were all overweight. Every patient was overweight. And I was overweight, and there was no vaccine. I was like, I got to do something about this. So I decided I would get in shape. However, every gym in LA was closed. So I had to get creative. So every day, I would wake up and I would have a big breakfast. Oatmeal, bananas, orange juice, put on my shoes, and then I would run like four to five lines of cocaine right up my nose. <laughs> and the weight came right off. I also played basketball to lose weight. Being from North Carolina, I like to play basketball. So I went down to a park to play basketball in the middle of the pandemic. And I'm waiting to get into this pickup game, and I look across the court, and I see a woman breastfeeding her baby. And I just want to say, I don't have any issues with women breastfeeding in public. No issues. But when she saw me, she got defensive. And she said, excuse me, sir, is there a problem? And I was like, no, no problem at all. And I just want you and your baby to know I got next. <laughs> I also watched a lot of TV to take my mind off of things. Um, I started watching The Bachelorette of all things, which I found is actually just a bunch of dudes hanging out talking to each other. <laughs> It's so bizarre. And this girl, she goes, I just had a group date with 13 guys. And I was like, I can see this on Pornhub. <laughs> Started dating again during the pandemic. Thank you so much. I gotta tell you, uh, I didn't date before in LA because I'm an educated nurse. And I know the HPV statistics here. <laughs> it's rampant. But dating is especially difficult in LA, very difficult. And my biggest problem for me dating in LA is that I happen to be a magnet for women with mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> 
since I've been in LA, I have dated an alcoholic. I've dated a kleptomaniac. And I dated a schizophrenic. I had to break up with her twice. And she had multiple personalities. You know, I liked her a lot though. I introduced her to my family. She was a terrific plus two at my cousin's wedding. <laughs> Anybody here on the dating apps? I got on Hinge only because I found out they had discontinued casual encounters on Craigslist. <laughs> but I can tell you from my experience, if you're on Hinge and you see the headline, clean and sober, that person has a criminal record. <laughs> Which means I'm interested. <laughs> meet a lot of interesting people on Hinge. I met, I met a very kinky woman on Hinge. And what happened was we were getting frisky and all of a sudden she goes, hey, Sean. Do you want to pee on me? I was like, not really. She's like, do you want me to pee on you? I was like, no. And she's like, why not? I'm like, cause I'm a nurse. I get peed on every day at work. But you can shit on me. Uh, I had an awkward experience on Hinge. Um, I saw my buddy's wife on there. I know, right? And even to this day, I'm still trying to find a way to tell my buddy I saw his wife seven times in September. <laughs> I actually, believe it or not, I got laid a lot during the pandemic. I got laid a lot. A lot. You want to know why? Because women love a man in uniform. <laughs> I probably didn't need to dress up like a police officer. <laughs> probably didn't need to do that. There's one thing that I realized, though, when I started dating again. What I learned was that I would date anyone. I learned that about myself. Doesn't matter what your race is. Doesn't matter what your religion is. Doesn't matter what your creed is. I would date you. Because for me, beauty is skin deep. Or graft deep if you've been in a fire. A friend of mine challenged me on that. And he said, you wouldn't date anyone. And I was like, yes, I would. And he was like, you wouldn't date MMA fighter Ronda Rousey. I was like, I would absolutely date her. First off, she's beautiful, and I am not intimidated by her athleticism. In fact, it'd be nice to have someone choke me out for a change. <laughs> this one girl I dated, I, that's how I know I would date anyone. I dated this girl that reminded me of a horse. <laughs> And it wasn't just because she was tall and had long hair. It was like, every time we were having sex, she'd go, And I always knew always knew when she was going to have an orgasm because she'd go <laughs> you know the last time i went out with her she broke her leg so i had to put her down <laughs> i have a girlfriend now i have a girlfriend thank you You're applauding like that's the first time that ever happened. I'm actually dating a Latina for the first time. 
Yes. Up until this point, just been a fan from afar, that's all. <laughs> just been a fan from afar. I love Latinas, and I'll tell you why. Because Latinas are loyal. My girl will do anything for me. The other day I was all upset, and she goes, what's wrong, baby? And I was like, there's this crappy comedy club in Burbank that won't book me. <laughs> And she was like, I'm sorry, baby. You want me to burn that bitch down? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and will you be my wife? <laughs> yeah, I do like my girlfriend a lot. But uh, I have one issue with my girlfriend. It's that... She's a Latina, and she does not speak a word of Spanish. <laughs> not a word of Spanish. And it's a problem for me, because yo hablo espanol. Mucho. <laughs> mucho. Mucho. <laughs> no, it's been starting to cause a rift in our relationship, the fact that she doesn't speak Spanish. Like, I wanted to say something really sweet to her the other night when we were in bed. So I said, ah, mi bonita chica. <laughs> and she goes, what the fuck did you just say to me? <laughs> I was like, I said, the condom broke and I came inside of you. <laughs> My girlfriend is actually of Mexican descent. However, when I got to know her a little bit better, I found out that her vagina identifies as Brazilian. <laughs> you know, we actually made it through the holidays, which is great. We made it through Christmas. I didn't know if we were gonna make it. Because you wanna know why? For Christmas, she asked for Gucci, okay? And I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't know what Gucci was. <laughs> Did not know what Gucci was. And then I found out what Gucci was, and I was like, you're not getting Gucci. <laughs> so instead, I got her gonorrhea. <laughs> I'm actually trying to be a better boyfriend. That's something I'm working on. I want to be a better boyfriend. So I'm trying this new thing, it's called words of affirmation. I'm working on it. So sometimes what I do is I'll just say something very softly. I'll whisper into my girlfriend's ear, I'll go, you are so lucky to have me. <laughs> my girlfriend and I both believe in having a healthy sexual relationship. And we like to try different things in bed sometimes. But I don't like her suggestions sometimes. Like the other night she said, hey Sean, do you wanna wear a blindfold while we have sex? And I was like, babe, that's really cute and everything, but I don't need a blindfold to think about other women. <laughs> Anyway, she's been cool though. I can't complain because she's been very cool about shit. You know what I mean? She's been very cool, especially this week. I had a very awkward situation happen. I started getting texts from an ex this week. Have you ever gotten a text from an ex that was like a picture or an ultrasound, if you will? <laughs> And the caption said, this was yours? Oh. Phew. <laughs> and I did what any other guy would have done. I said, what makes you think it was mine? And she said, because he came way too early. <laughs> D 
definitely my kid. I've been fighting COVID for two years, but I want to tell you all about a health epidemic that is much worse than COVID. It's killing people by the millions, and it's called the body positivity movement. Okay? Look, I'm not saying it's okay to make fun of people because they're overweight. I'm not saying that at all, okay? I'm just saying you gotta be healthy, that's all. And I'm not a hypocrite, okay? I'm not a hypocrite. I was overweight. And I'm telling you this because I had to get on a friend recently. He was really overweight. And I said, you gotta lose the weight, man. And you know what he said to me? He goes, my doctor says I'm healthy. And I was like, your doctor gave up on you. <laughs> I got on his wife too. I said, your wife is overweight, man. Your wife is overweight. You, gotta do, you guys go, both gotta get healthy. You know what his response was? He said, big girls need love too. And I was like, well, they need cardio more. <laughs> well, I'll just end it with this then. I'll just say this, okay? Some of you here right now are trying to figure out if I'm a good guy, right? This whole time, you're like, is he a good guy? You're trying to think of it. You wanted me to win you over at some point. I just want you to know that I am a good guy. I am a good guy. And I'll tell you why. Because every time my girlfriend is sucking my dick, <laughs> every time she's sucking my dick and I'm about to come, I always ask her, pulp or no pulp? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to end it on that right there. Thank you guys so much. Good, everybody. This debut album, you just hear it. You heard it live for everybody else. Yeah.